I am here this afternoon in San Antonio, Texas with Dr. Sandra Alfonsi. Did I say that correctly? That's correct. All right. Um, I'm, would you introduce yourself to my audience, give them an idea as to who you are? Well, I'm a university professor by profession. I teach at, I, I'm a professor of modern foreign languages, French and Italian language and literature. Okay. But the other part of my life is I'm the I'm past national vice president for Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. And I'm chair of Curriculum Watch, which is their major program. It is a national program on the textbooks. Um, I'm a part of the Truth in Texas Textbooks Coalition. Very their, good. Their chief researcher. And I now have joined with Roy and with Brigitte Gabriel to be the chief researcher on the textbooks issues for Act for America Education. Fabulous. And that's who I am professionally and my interests. I, am a, I was a first soloist in the Civic Ballet of Washington, so I was, I was a ballerina. Oh, very and, good. Um, I am a very, very, very proud, educated Jew. Um, I have always considered myself a, an American Jew I'm as dif to differentiate between a Jewish American. I consider my, <clears throat> my Judaism, my identity as a Jew because I could have been born anywhere, which would have mm -hmm. made me a French Jew, an American Jew, anywhere. So I consider myself as um, an American Jew. I consider myself as uh, an offspring and a descendant of all those who perished in the Holocaust. Yes. I have a very deep belief that uh, when we say at Passover that we all of, all of us, our souls stood at the foot of Mount Sinai mm -hmm. when the Ten Commandments were given, I truly believe that um, that is where I came from, that is where my passion for Judaism and for Israel came from. and. The work that I do on the textbooks, that at one time that was an interest, then it became a passion, and now it is my obsession. Wow, okay. And when it comes to Israel, uh, that is the, my mother said to me that she believed she dropped me on my head when I was <laughs> born, and I came out as a Zionist. She said she doesn't know where it came from, but it is there, it is who I am. Um, all of these, these terrorist attacks and all of the, the verbiage that came out which, with Charlie Hebdo, Je suis Charlie, and then it was Je suis Juif, Je suis Paris. Um, I like to say, I am a Jew. I, I, I say it in this order, I am Israel, I am a Jew, I am Hadassah. And that, mm -hmm. is, that covers all of my interests and how I got into a lot of my um, obsessions and how what gives me the strength to do what I do is that as an academic I, I was subjected to, and my husband and I together because he also was an academic, to... Is he also a Jew? Yes, he's okay. an Italian Jew. He died okay. three years ago. Oh, yes, okay. he's a, from Italy, an Italian Jew, and we did our PhDs together. We taught always together the same departments at the same universities uh -huh. and shared an office. So we had a lot in common. But we experienced firsthand the virulent anti-Semitism in academia. Here in the United States? In the States. United States, yes. What type of things? Um, well... And where, whereabouts in the country? We're Fordham, you know, we, we are always taught in New York. Okay. And... Um, at Fordham University in the Bronx, um, I, I taught French there, and my students, I, ta I always talk about Israel, and, and we find enough literature to deal with it. So my students, who were very sweet, very innocent, beautiful Catholic students, um, they said, oh, you know, Dr. Alfonsi, we think you should be the faculty advisor to the Middle Eastern Studies Club because we believe you're the only <coughs> person we've met who can sit down with the Jew and with the Arab and talk. So I had one student from Connecticut who s said to me, 
you're the only Jew who could do this. And then she said, actually, I think you're the only Jewish person I've ever met, and that's coming out of the Catholic school system in Connecticut. Wow. Wow. But I, so I accepted because these students were members of it. And then I was blacklisted by the, the chairman of the Middle Eastern Studies Department at Fordham University. And I was blacklisted. And these are, this, this is the language. This is exactly what was said and what exactly was written was that I, am an ex I was an unsuitable faculty advisor for the Middle Eastern Studies Club because I am an extremist because I am a Jew. And, wow. they, and they closed my classes. That is how you blacklist very easily. You cut the enrollment. And I, I was an adjunct. I was adjunct and in rank for, you know, always teaching language, teaching literature. But being an adjunct was both, it was a luxury because it allowed me to do all of my work with Hadassah. And it was also because when I met Ferdinando, my husband, when we did our PhDs, to me, I wanted him to have the full-time position as long as I was teaching. So it, it worked fine. It gave me the time to do Hadassah, and that started out as a chapter president, the region president, vice president of National Hadassah, and now the, for all of these years, the chair of the textbook program. But this is how I was blacklisted, and the only way that I was able not to be fired was to say I don't really want to be the uh, faculty advisor, and it's magnificent. The minute I stepped down from being the faculty advisor, I held two meetings before I finally gave up, and it was very successful because I brought in a Coptic, a Coptic priest who would never have been brought in, and we had phenomenal programs, and then I said, I, as much as I believe in this, I want my job. And I, I met anti-Semitism from the fact is that the Romance Language Department, now their Modern Language Department, mm -hmm. they are predominantly in the hands of, um, I, will, I will say, Hispanics and Latinos, and they are very, very virulently anti-Semitic by nature. Those who came from Spain were not. The French are very anti-Semitic, so I came head into also at Fordham University, the head of the French department. So it was it was very ugly. But when I was blacklisted, simultaneous, it's like life is very very peculiar. Things happen at the worst moment, and I'm like nobody really cares that there's a Jewish professor over here at Fordham University, and this is going on at that same time. June Walker, who was the head of the American Affairs of Hadassah, said. We're going to start a program of textbooks. Do you want to do the reviews? And I said, yes. That's how that began. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've been doing it ever since because as an academic, and we have an academic advisory board. Simultaneously with that, I went over to the Israeli consulate in New York, and I met with the, um, the Council for Academic Affairs at that time, Efraim Ben Matityahu. He's now the ambassador to the Philippines. Hmm. But when I met Effie, I told him what happened. He said, look, I'll bring one of our beautiful photography programs over to Fordham. They'll understand what Israel is. We'll do the big archaeology uh, program. And it was very successful, except for the head of the Middle Eastern Studies Department would not let his, his students participate. Now, the head of the Middle Eastern program uh, is of what faith? Do you know? Well, yes, he's Catholic. Catholic? Most of, and okay. Mo most of the faculty, Fordham, Fordham I have to it's say. It's a I, strong Catholic it's, university. It's Jesuit. Okay. And I, my husband and I both got our PhDs from the Catholic University of America, which is papal. Okay. Now, there's a big difference because when I, I was the first Jewish student to go through and get a PhD at Catholic University. I was also the youngest. <laughs> I got my PhD at 26. Very and good. I was a protected species. <laughs> I mean, I, I was protected. But being that it's a papal university and um, Pope John the 23rd came out with his encyclical, all of this was, you have, you have a Jewish person here. And I, I was not prepared for the anti-Semitism of the, the Jesuits in Fordham University. Neither was wow. my husband. Neither was my husband. 
but the, when I came back... That, and, and I've got to back up, because yes. as a Christian, it, it's somewhat, and maybe it's my lack of, uh, lack of knowledge, totally, but it seems unusual that the Catholic faith would create difficulties for the Jewish. Well, I'm, I have to just add, I'm just speaking, I don't, I don't filter, I have to say what it is. Right. Uh, before Pope John XXIII came out with the encyclical and with the statement that the Jews were not responsible for the death of Jesus, um, it was very, very difficult, and Christmas, Christmas was one problem, but the, the problem always emotionally and fear level-wise was always at Easter. So to be a Jewish student in a Catholic facility, in a Catholic university, when, when um, the birth of Jesus was something which, if I, if I, I tried to remind people, you know, do remember that Christianity came from Judaism and Jesus Ju was... Jesus is a Jew. Is a Jew. Yes. And, and, but Easter... I was, my parents, you're going to Catholic University, I said, yeah, I'll be safe there, don't worry. Well, Catholic University, I was fine because I took Latin, I wanted to, to I was going to major in Latin only to find out that nobody did that, but I studied advanced Latin with nuns and priests, and it was very good, but the nuns used to sit on either side of me and cover my legs with their, with their habits, oh. and, and <laughs> I loved it there, you know, they, they, I said to my, my parents for Passover, I have, I'm bringing a few of my, uh, my friends home from, from Catholic U for the Seder. And, you know, in walked, you know, I brought home my priests mm -hmm. and I brought home a couple of nuns and we were, we did fine. Yeah. That's why I was unprepared for yeah. Fordham University. Yeah, and, 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 and of course I, I'm from San Angelo and we have an extremely small Jewish community there. I think we have like the second oldest Jewish synagogue in Texas there, but I think uh, we only have four, eight maybe families that are Jewish in our whole community. So we're very, very, so I haven't had a lot of exposure. So I, I find this fascinating and unfortunate, not a good positive um, at all. That, I, I have uh, to say honestly that Texas is like a light for my life because I, I enjoy it, um, getting to know Act for America people, but getting to interact with so many Christians on the level of being everyone being a person. Yeah. And it's to me, it's the way I thought life was supposed to be. Exactly. And to find out that in academia, of all places, that wasn't what life was about. And wow. I could have, you know, I, I could have sued because that was terrible. And the president of the of Fordham said to me, "You're not going to sue us." I said, "Why? Well, I'm not going to sue." You. He said, well, "What? What do you want from us?" I said, "I want the archaeology exhibit from the consulate, and I want the academic affairs, the Council for Academic Affairs, to present this program." And the president of, of Fordham looked at me and he said, "Thank you." I said. You did it to me. I'm not going to do something terrible and ruin the reputation. Just fix this. Yeah. It, it didn't get fixed. Yeah, that's but unfortunate. I took my students over to the consulate, my, my nice little fort of Christian students, and, and Effie prepared this whole program with the maps of Israel and everything, and when explained to them that this is actually foreign ground, and they all came, and it was fascinating. But the, the notes and the phone calls that I received from the parents thanking me for doing this, for teaching their children. So that is, that's, I look at academia and I look at the, the virulent anti-Semitism, but right now the, the virulent anti-Semitism that's, that's around the world and in this country, I call it, this is the medieval Christian anti-Semitism that never went away that has been just put on fire by the Islamist anti-Semitism. But right now is not a time for differences in my, in my view. In my view right now that there is Judaism and there's Christianity and there's... We the must Jude stand together. Yes, and there's the Judeo-Christian tradition. And to me, the, that I always understood what it meant. 
it meant all of the similarities and beliefs and ethics and morality. That is what the Judeo-Christian tradition is. So I find that that's what we've lost. Yeah. And then we have a professor from Georgetown University who said, no, no, this country was founded on the Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions. And our founding, founding fathers definitely would never have adhered, adhered to this. No, no. So, so with what it, uh, so with what's going on in our country right now, with um, ISIS, with terrorism, with uh, this hate toward Christians as well as Jews, does it strike a deeper chord, possibly, with you being a Jew, uh, because of your heritage and the background and what's happened before to the Jewish community? Something us as Christians need to be very sensitive to and aware of. Because we're on that hate list now. I think that it has to work in reverse this time because I, I'm more frightened for the Christians than I am for the Jews because we have a long record of attempts to, to exterminate us. Yes. To understand. I feel I, I'm totally amazed by the, um, the, so many of the Jews of this country that don't know who they are, don't know what we were, and don't have any concept of anything, but are so liberal that if you make nice, everything will go away, and it won't. But I'm more frightened for, for the Christians because I don't think that there has been the response in this country for the anti-Christian slaughter. And I think that the, the fact that the truth is that I do not understand why we are we do not raise a flag that we're not bringing in the Christians who are the survivors and who have been that they are that they survive the terrorism over there, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid for the Christians in this country for one main reason. We we don't we haven't had anything on this soil since the Civil War, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Christian, uh, I mean, my Christian friends, and I now consider the state of Texas, I've, I've adopted the state of Texas. Good, we'll take you. I love it, <laughs> but I, I'm afraid for them because there, there isn't an understanding, and there comes a time where if it's, you know, it doesn't matter because anti-Semitism is an everyday household word, so if the Jews are, if something happens to the Jews, it doesn't impact the Christians, and so there's there's a disconnect. Yes. And it frightens me because there's a disconnect and there's a naivete. The Jews are just plain stupid as far as I'm concerned now. I, I, I don't consider naivete. I think that they've buried their heads in the sand and they think that by pretending to be like everybody else, you know, mm. I, I dislike, the, I don't believe in the expression of, oh, he's a Jew-hating Jew, no. He's a self-hating Jew. No. The, their, the height of arrogance in the Jews that come out with their attacks on Israel and their attacks on Judaism, they are not, as far as I'm concerned, uh, self-hating Jews. They are the Jews with the biggest egos who say, we've done it, we're here, and this is what it is. We don't need to be like the other people. I was born with a ghetto mentality, I, I, and I still have my ghetto mentality because mm -hmm. that's my sense of self-preservation. Yes. And I don't think the Christians have that self, that, that sense of self-preservation. No, no. Well, here in this country, they've never had to experience anything. Uh, one of the interviews I did a few months ago with, was with a Chaldean uh, out of Ira uh, Iraq that we actually dropped bombs on when he was 10 years old. And he has finally made it to his dream country, America. And it's interesting, his reaction to other Christians. Because it's like, uh, they need to wake up. Because he too, he's, he's expression, expressing that same concern that we're oblivious. We're so busy with all the distractions of life that we have in this country that when it comes down to what's really real, no one's paying attention. I mean, even... It sounds simplistic concerning Christmas. I mean, I have no problem saying Merry Christmas, and I have no problem saying thank you when someone with all good intentions and good heart wishes me Merry Christmas, because 
to me, that's fine. I, I think that the Christians have backed away from their Christianity. And it isn't the holiday party, and it isn't happy holidays. No. And if you, if you know that the person is Jewish, then you wish the person happy, happy Hanukkah. If it's mm -hmm. not Hanukkah, to, to a Jewish person, you can say, have a happy holiday. But to give up that identity, no. and I think no. it's wrong. I, I just think that, that you can't get back what you give away. Yeah. Well, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith are truly faith, whereas Islam is an ideology. And mm, they say less than 16% of the Quran, Hadith, and the Book of Muhammad has anything to do with what we would even begin to relate to being a faith or a religion. So it's uh, interesting, and I think that we need to pull Islam out of the category of being a religion because well, of that. Well, it's taught as a world religion, and, and it's the third, it, that's another problem when we do the textbooks, that the chronology of world religions is askew because it's supposed to be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and it's just, it's gone the other way. Mm. Islam first. It, it, it is a religion to a point, and I think that our error in teaching world religions is that we've, we have substituted culture for religion. And I think that yeah. that is the, the problem. I mean, like, there, there are bagel and lox Jews. Mm -hmm. There are spaghetti Italians. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do okay. you do on Sunday? You for, oh, we get together around the family table and we have, we have pasta. Mm -hmm. so, but that's culture mm -hmm. that isn't religion no and and I you know I'm the a member I'm the, the, the secretary of the, the largest interfaith organization in the Poconos and it's called Opportunity Associates and we do we're on our third year of uh, spirituality in the community that is trying to identify it and up until I joined it, they were always doing it on Saturday, so the Jews couldn't participate, the rabbi couldn't participate. Last, last year, I said to the rabbi, you take care of my synagogue, because I'm the president of the synagogue. He said, you do that. I said, to me, this is, this is Sabbath work. I attended because I wanted to hear what was said about the Judaism, and mm -hmm. one of the presenters was a Jewish professor from East Stroudsburg University, and she said, I don't belong to any denomination. I don't go to the synagogue. I am a bagel and lox Jew. I wanted to die. I, I just wanted to, to go underground because I had, there, there was one other Jewish person. And they said, me, you're Sandra, right? I said, yes, you're the president of the synagogue. I said, yes, and why are you here? I said, because I'm taking care of Judaism. This year, we're doing it on Sunday in the afternoon so that the Christians can go to church and then come to this and we are doing music as spirituality. And, Interesting. And the first time the, the, <coughs> they knew nothing about Jewish music, so I'm providing that. And Fabulous. It, it's a, it'll be a beautiful show. Yeah. But I think that we've given up too many things, and I think that when, when Judaism and Christianity are, are put basically as culture, but Islam is put as Sharia, and Islam is put their, their religion with the Quran, and the idea when they stay, well, they state that um, there's, they respect the, the Jews and the Christians as people of the book, and you can disprove that moment in, from time to time, you can do that. The problem is that the Jews were known as the people of the book, and I always say to the to the, when in the textbooks, I said, you know what, we may be the people of the book. First of all, I don't know what book it is, <laughs> but we haven't looked at our textbooks in years. And and Christmas time, you know, I love the lights, and I love I love to I love to say Merry Christmas. I love to see the people happy. But what I notice is that there's less and less of Christianity in Christmas. It's changed a lot in our lifetime. Yeah. It really and, has. And to, to turn this to the point where it's happy holidays, I, I, that is 
that we are we are destroying ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we've we've really got to not only reclaim our, our faith uh, and our and our culture, the, the foundation of our right. country, that kind of culture. Uh, but we've got to recapture our country too and what it was founded on. Yes. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, from the academic world, Jewish, we've got a mess right now. What do you see? Do you see a ray of hope uh, of, of how do we begin to tackle this monster and begin to retrain and, and go back to some of those good Jewish roots, American roots, uh, Christian roots that we have totally lost. And without our roots, without a foundation, there is nothing stable. I, I think that I, I have no rays of hope in anything. I'm not a pessimist. I, I'd like to say that I am a realist. I am looking at probably in my lifetime the most horrible vision of religion, of humanity, of America, of Israel, of the world. Mm. Now, when it comes to the United States, I think that this election, without speaking of candidates or anything else, I think that this election, that we are at a watershed and that this election is the most critical election Amen. that this country has ever faced. Without question, without and, question. And I think that I, I, when I studied American history, when I studied history, America was always an isolationist country. That is why foreign languages really never were, were considered that important in this country because it was always the American dollar, the English language. And we, we by not teaching the humanities, what we've done to Americans is make Americans totally unable, unable to understand the foreign mind. And if you don't study mm -hmm. foreign languages, you cannot read in the natural, in the native language, and you really do not know, based on the translations, how the people think. And I think this has exploded in our face in Lebanon when, when the marine barracks were blown up because there was no one in there who could understand the particular dialect of Arabic when hmm. that is the reason that we were totally unprepared. Wow. And over here, we, we do not understand the Middle Eastern mind. No, we, we not don't, at all. We don't understand the Brits. We don't, un we don't understand because we were totally isolationist and we looked in at ourselves. Now we seem to have this, this mania of of trying to absorb the Middle East and make apologies for it and totally disregard America. And the, the, the textbooks do it, we do it, and I think that, um, you may cut this out, but I will say that I think that we put a sleeper cell in the White House. And, Probably so. And unlike newspapers and others who said that there were no Arabs out, no Muslims or Arabs out on the streets shooting rifles after the Twin Towers came down. I saw it in Astoria, Queens. I saw it in Brooklyn, New York. I saw it in Patterson, New Jersey. And I will never forget seeing it on the television. Wow, so what Trump said said is, is yes. absolutely true. And a true. lot of us saw it. Wow. And the same ones who saw it We'll never forget the vision oh, heavens, no. of the yeah. of the Twin Towers. And I, I'll tell you something that's when we said about things happening. I was in charge of, for National Hadassah, we have five regions, metropolitan regions of Hadassah, and I was in charge of preparing a symposium for the five regions up at State University of New York at SUNY Purchase at Purchase. And the... It, it was on terrorism. Hmm. And that is where I was going. I was going to Lower State, New York. That day that the Twin Towers came down, wow. I was driving to the Jewish Community Center with my entire little group of people to put together 
this symposium on terrorism. And as I was driving, wow. someone called and said, Sandra, pull over to the side of the road. So I said, why? He said, don't ask me questions. Pull over. I have to tell you something. So he said that, and he was someone who worked for me for Adas, and he said that there was a terrorist attack and the first tower has come down. Oh my goodness. And there to the Jewish Community Center in, in Rockland County, and as I walked in, the big television set, we stood and watched the second tower come down. Yeah. And then we sat for six hours and planned this big symposium on terrorism. So things happen, and it was, it was meant to be. And we had this tremendous symposium on terrorism. I bet. Wow. But we, what timing. But we planned it on 9-11. Got our speakers, got our plans, tweaked it a bit because we did what was supposed to have started out first with the textbooks I put into third place. And Daniel Pipes came and he spoke. We did, Ephraim Karsh came from England to speak, and he's one of the leading authorities on Islam. And we put this together, and there was an outcry in this country on 9-11. Yes, yes. And then the outcry went away. Yeah. And a mosque was built right at the foot of all of this. And this is supposed to be, make better neighbors. It's supposed, to, it's all that this country, this country is naive, terribly naive, because if you read the Quran and you've studied this, you understand that from time on, the, the whole purpose is to bring Islam to the entire world. Yes, which will destroy America, culture, music, uh, all of our art, everything will be gone. Uh, and Christians and Jews. Yes. and I mean, it's interesting <clears throat> because when they say that they want peace, well, the only way they can have peace in their book is when all of us are gone. So I mean, they give you three choices. Yeah. They give you conversion to Islam. They give you to live in as a demi, the demi two, the second state, second rate citizen, second class citizen, or they give you extinction. And that is that was originally reserved just for Israel, the Zionist entity, which still has no name. That was to be eliminated. But if you watch the march across, you know, their, their, <laughs> their obsession with the Crusades, the Islamic wow. obsession with the Crusades was because they failed. They failed, and they, they, can, they still, to this day, consider the West the Crusaders. Hmm. So I find that we learn nothing from 9-11, nothing. Well, it's interesting because I, I know tonight you're going to talk about textbooks, and one of the things that uh, even in my, I'm 59, in my years of going through school, I was never taught that the the first battles that the America fought were the Muslims that were trying to break our trade with the yes. ships and all. I mean, that's like, whoa, you know, so even decades ago, we were already, have our textbooks were already being altered and things were already being removed. So it'll be very fascinating to hear everything that you've got to share this evening. I, I appreciate your time. This has been most fascinating. I would, um, gee, we need to do more interviews. We've got lots of topics we could cover. But I'm looking forward to you speaking uh, this evening and to hear what's been going on here in Texas, in our textbooks, that you're going to be sharing with uh, the audience at Act for America tonight. Thank so, you. Dr. Alfonsi, thank you so much My for your pleasure. time this afternoon. My pleasure, really.